Good evening. Welcome to the UFM Lou Douglas Lecture Series on Public Issues. My name is John Fleiter, and I serve on the Lou Douglas Lecture Series Committee. For 26 years, the Lou Douglas Lecture Series has brought thought-provoking speakers to the KSU campus to discuss topics concerning human rights, social justice, and economic development. Tonight's lecture by Professor Patricia Williams of the Columbia University School of Law is jointly sponsored with the Dorothy L. Thompson Civil Rights Lecture Series and the University Distinguished Lecturers Committee. The Lou Douglas Committee would like to thank the Student Activities Board, various academic departments, and community patrons for their annual contributions to this series. Also a special thank you to Provost Nellis for his support of the series. There will be a question and answer session following the lecture, and I encourage you to stay and ask the speaker some questions. We will take a break for about a few minutes to allow those of you who have to leave to exit the hall. And then once uh, we finish with the break, I ask you to please come to the microphones so uh, you can ask your questions and everyone can hear you. Okay. There is also a book signing in the hall outside the ballroom after the lecture, right at the table there, and copies of Professor Williams' books will be available for you to purchase. Okay. Uh, now I'd like to turn things over to Provost Nellis, who will introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, John, and good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure for me tonight to introduce our speaker. Uh, but before I introduce our speaker, I did want to comment on the three lecture series sponsors. Uh, John has already mentioned them, but I wanted to elaborate just briefly on them. The Lou Douglas Lecture Series on Public Issues was launched in honor of the memory of Lou Douglas, a professor of political science at Kansas State University who served as professor from 1949 to 1977. The lecture series deals with topics that Lou championed, which include issues of world peace, human rights, and social justice. The Dorothy L. Thompson Civil Rights Lecture Series was established to recognize Dorothy Thompson's contributions to the field of human rights on campuses throughout Kansas and the nation. Dorothy served as K-State's first Affirmative Action Director and later as Associate University Attorney until her death in 1992. The, the, the Distinguished Lecture Series Committee was created by the Office of the Provost to provide a platform for prominent visiting researchers and scholars and distinguished public intellectuals. These lecture series and the planners of the Community Cultural Harmony Week could not have selected a speaker more fitting than that of Patricia Williams to speak to us tonight. Embraced as one of the most Provocative intellectuals in American law, civil liberties, and social justice, Patricia Williams is a graduate of Wellesley College and Harvard Law School. She has served on the faculties of the University of Wisconsin School of Law, the Women's Studies Program at Harvard, and the City University of New York Law School at Queens College. She has had fellowships at Dartmouth College, the University of California at Irvine, and at Stanford University and she's currently a professor of law at Columbia University School of Law. She is a recent recipient of the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in which she received the Genius Award of $500,000. She's the author of numerous books, including The Alchemy of Race and Rights, A Diary of a Law Professor, Seeing a Colorblind Future, The Paradox of Race, and her most recent book, Open House, A Family, Friends, Food, Piano Lessons, and A Search for a Room of My Own. She has authored numerous articles for journals and newspapers, including USA Today, Harvard Law Review, the New York Times Book Review, Miss Magazine, and The Village Voice. And she's appeared in a number of documentary films, which she wrote and narrated. Truly a champion of social justice, please help me in welcoming Patricia Williams. Uh, 
Um, thank you so much for that very warm welcome. Um, I'd like to thank the provost and um, the entire committee of the Lou Douglas um, lectureship. Uh, my, my, my welcome to Kansas has been so enormously warm, and uh, I am simply delighted to be here. Um, I, I, I've, I think in contemplating coming here, uh, I got the invitation sometime early in the summer, as I recall, uh, and I had decided to talk about something fairly different. But since, uh, since the, the, the Hurricane Katrina at the beginning of September, um, I, I've been meditating a lot about the nature of home and of citizenship and what makes us have a sense of place. Um, I spent the summer clearing out my parents' house, which is a house that has been in our family for over a hundred years. And perhaps of that, because of that fact, uh, perhaps because it was so much like an archaeological dig, sort of finding all these things that placed me and that shaped me, um, I was coming to the end of this task just as Katrina roared in and a significant bit of that world fell apart. And so I'm haunted by pictures of that flood, of all of that loss, all that grief and separation, um, the tearing apart of lives, of homes, of memories, of culture. And I sort of pace with worry for all the unleashed past and the unmoored present. Those levees, I think, were like some perfect metaphor for our civil rights movement, um, holding back the impossible for an impossibly long time. Now, I think that the image of this flood as a kind of metaphor and the difference in perception, apparently, that certain polls seem to indicate that white people in the majority in this country feel that it has nothing to do with race and uh, like 102 percent of black people feel <laughs> that it does, <laughs> um, keeps me awake at night. Um, and I'm stuck with the image, with a series of images. One is the image, um, uh, the kind of image that one sees, and one sees them every other day in the newspaper since then. Today's newspaper, for example, talked about a parish of uh, St. Uh, Helena, just 80 miles northwest of New Orleans, um, where FEMA wants to build a temporary shelter uh, for migrants from the, uh, or evacuees from the, from the floods. And uh, they, the, the, the evacuees being largely black and the residents of this community being largely white. Um, there is a controversy has resulted and some resistance. And there are these statements like, they're rapists and thugs and murderers. I'm telling you, half of them have criminal records. I worked all my life to have what I have. I can't lose it, and I can't stand guard 24 hours a day as a reason not to build, that FEMA wants to buy land and build a trailer camp or park or temporary housing. I want to know how many are sex offenders. They're going to move in next door to me, and I've got daughters. Um, and then the response is, well, you know, we've worked hard for what we um, have to or had to. Um, I, in the middle of the night, I wake up with images of Gretna, Louisiana, which was the community that sealed off the bridges to their town, shooting warning shots at the multitudes who were streaming from rapidly rising floodwaters. Um, a few days ago, Gretna, Louisiana, became very concerned about the way in which it had, been, it had been depicted in the media, and so it decided it wanted a chance to defend itself. And the defense surprised me because it presented um, a story that said that the city council has issued a commendation to the police chief for having fought off the invaders so well, um, for issuing the shoot to kill, um, or at least shoot over their heads, um, warning. He protected us, said one woman. Um, and as another woman said, um, I wouldn't want to be caught on the freeway with a bunch of maniacs. Now, it reminds me of the Titanic. The grates have come down, the steerage goes down, clawing and desperate, eluding and a shooting into the bowl of soup. Um, but hey, it was their choice to get the cheap tickets out of town to wait too long to expect big government to bail them out in any way they never had it so good. 
Now, I do wonder what would have happened if that group, and there was one very, there were several groups that pressed their way across that bridge um, to be turned back by the shooting policemen. Um, but I do wonder what would have happened if they had pressed on to save their lives. Um, there was one particular group of 200 that actually turned out to be fairly middle class people, but included a number of radio announcers and media people, which is why the story got so much attention. Um, they were African American, but they were also quite middle class, although they may not have looked like this in the, in the, in the flight. Um, but if they had pressed on, you know, it, it, it did sort of look like, you know, sort of the bridge in Birmingham or in, in, in certain moments of the civil rights movement as it was depicted. The, 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 the pictures were very evocative, and, and there were no fire hoses this time, just this shooting policy instead, something like fire this time, um, and justified by new theories of warranty, effectively immunizing against a certain degree of police recklessness, or what I see as, as, as police reckness, recklessness, and that was not the only place where police were shooting. Um, Again, with this new term that you might have heard, because it actually began in small towns where people were, uh, during the PCP craze, this, this term, suicide by cop, where people intoxicated on drugs would act a little bit bizarrely and, and they would come, they would charge police. And, and this term has taken on a life of its own. And I hear it more and more, uh, this term, suicide by cop, and I heard it over and over again in the context of um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the flood, um, and it, it, and it, it, it was a, it was a, it felt sad and ironic, so close on the heels of the death of Jean-Charles uh, de Menezes, the, the young Brazilian man who was shot in London, um, around whom that term was used in the British press, um, before actually people got very upset about it, but, but, but people said, he, that the police didn't really shoot him, the terrorists made us shoot him. So the agency was removed. Now again, whatever one may think of the need to defend oneself in the face of terror, I am very disturbed by that removal of agency. And I, I, I do want to come back to um, the degree to which that lessens the accountability for each other um, and what we call on our armed guards to do for us. Um, but this term suicide by cop, if you defy a police order and keep coming and the policeman shoots to kill, the rationalization is that you knew it was going to happen. You defied a police order and therefore you chose to kill yourself because the policeman had no choice but to kill you. He was a neutral instrumentality. So we, so we, so we sort of take the active voice um, out of the charge to our public servants um, in which uh, guns don't kill people and now police don't kill people. It's those people who kill people except when they're those people who commit suicide by cop. But um, in the wake of this unprecedented disaster, it's very hard, I think, to tell what's fact or fear from the witness accounts just yet. But one thing that I do think seems to be settling out of this is the very remarkable degree to which people were sorted after the, after the event those descriptions of people in shelters in which elderly were taken from their families, the sick from their caretakers, newborns from their mothers, and because men were apparently segregated from women, husbands from wives, mothers from sons, families taken and put, pulled asunder. I heard one unidentified authority on the radio, National Public Radio, saying that when people were evacuated to other states, they were also not told where they were going. And the reason that he cited was that it would make them less unruly, which is a very different reason than what I had thought, which was that they simply were doing it to disperse people as rapidly as possible. But apparently it was a calculation to lessen the idea of, to lessen people, people's um, acting up. There were also accounts, however, of white foreign nationals, in particular I remember hearing a story of a British couple who owned a bar in the French Quarter, um, uh, who were lifted out, airlifted out, quote, secretly by National Guardsmen and warned not to go into the shelters at the Convention Center or the Super Bowl because it would be too dangerous for them. On NPR, a sociologist named Betty Hearn Morrow opined that it was less traumatic for people in distress to be grouped by what she called their own kind. It's just human nature, she said. Putting people into groups reinforces a sense of familiarity and security 
So they should be relocated, quote, according to their backgrounds. It lessens tensions. And she gave an example of sorting people from Guatemala and Nicaragua and how that would help keep the peace, although she did not explain how that worked as an analogy of separating Americans from Americans. My ears pricked up at this particular take on civil society, and I wondered what kind I might appear to be in case of an evacuation. Now, I have a 13-year-old son. He is almost six feet tall. And if we were fleeing without any identification, would anyone believe that he was a child? He's adopted. We don't particularly look alike. Would they believe that he was my mother, that I was his mother? Would he be sorted with adults? Would he be separated from me? Would we be put on separate buses to unknown compass points? Could I hope to be penned up with a group of my kind like middle-aged law professors? <laughs> and would I survive that? <laughs> or would it really become me with a sense of, quote, familiarity to be penned up and marched off with a group of other black women of my, quote, background? Now, I live in New York City, and according to Mayor Bloomberg, the city of New York has been divided into grids in case of catastrophe. People would be ordered from their homes or taken by force if necessary and marshaled along preset routes to reception centers where people would be identified by social security number and then relocated. And I do want to be a good citizen, part of the orderliness of a well-managed response to disaster. But with the images of New Orleans in mind, why on earth would any of us stream willingly toward such potential chaos? And it, I suppose something like a shoot to kill policy could make us stream willingly toward chaos, but it does seem to me that one of the most pressing issues for the future is clarifying the precise protocols for evacuation. If it is true that families are to be broken up as a means of crowd control, then perhaps just a little bit of public discussion is in order. And if it is true that white foreign nationals are a higher priority than solid black citizens, to what then shall we pledge our allegiance? Now, I want to sort of review some of the recent history, the configurations of this urban division, um, because certainly a lot of it has been attributed to a history of slavery, or a history of the South, or pre-civil rights, or post-reconstruction, whatever one will. Um, and uh, there was a, a sort of comforting, perhaps, fantasy that, that this was part, that this was history. I want to bring into the mix some of our more recent urban history, which I think is also part of the ingredient of what happened in New Orleans. Um, certainly, the, 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 the mass evacuation of white flight that characterized many cities, but that can't even be said necessarily of New Orleans. New Orleans has always been had its share of segregation going back um, many generations. Um, but I do think um, that uh, sort of from the time of the civil rights movement and riot, the urban riots and so forth, there has been a kind of demonization, particularly of young black men, um, but also of irresponsibility of black women and single black mothers, um, and a reassertion in the North, not just the South, um, of, of segregation, of patterns of segregation um, um, that have hardened both in the North and the South. So I don't think this is simply a Southern phenomenon. Now, when I was in college, I remember joining a court watching pro project in Roxbury, Massachusetts. And we observed criminal trials, then interviewed judges, lawyers, and witnesses. And during one unforgettable interview, a judge told me he never worried about cases coming out wrong because, quote, the police don't have time to arrest innocent people. If the defendant didn't commit this particular crime, he did something somewhere sometime. It was the most unreflective rationalization of suspect profiling I have ever heard, at least until recently, at least until the dual justice system set up and maturing around our New Age war on terror. And now I fear to hear it coming out again in the context of a national disaster in which I would assume there is a presumption of innocence, I mean, uh, you know, innocence by flood. Um, nevertheless, there does seem to be this emergent profiling at work. Um, I also think of 
aspects of our urban history, like in 1989, when I attended the Central Park Jogger Trial of five defendants who were only recently, in the last year or two, exonerated completely by DNA evidence indicating and implicating a convicted murderer named Matthias Reyes, who confessed to assaulting the jogger by himself. And indeed, I, when attending, to the, attending the trial, I was stunned by how little evidence there was, but there was a sort of hysteria that filled in the gaps. Um, and I remember attending the trial with uh, Kirsten Viewmiller, who's a political scientist at Amherst College, and she analyzed the way in which the prosecution acted in a very, as a very effective sonographer, leading the, or cinematographer, leading the jury into its, into a kind of imagined world of terror in the park. And the park had its own geography, a timeline, and a plot. And the entire plot was about who owns urban geography. Um, and which part, who owns the urban landscape. And my own concerns about misconduct in the trial didn't find an audience back then. And now, for what it's worth, perhaps it is possible to say that the courtroom mirrored the hysterical atmosphere in the city at large. And when I was attending that trial, lines extended around the block for admission as though it were a Broadway show because it was in all the newspapers all over the nation. It was sort of the, it was the, it, was, it set up to some extent the O.J. Simpson hysteria. Um, and I remember a busload of Italian tourists showing up, and they were turned away because the courtroom was full, but I remember a tour guide promising to find them something, quote, just as exciting. Um, and rafts of Hollywood celebrities dropped by for a look. Um, it, it just getting in was like some surreal circus wedding, and the press, like family, occupied the first two rows on both sides of the courtroom. Um, and the defendant's actual families were barred from the courtroom. And for all other attendees, the bailiffs would determine at the door whether one was, quote, with the prosecution or with the defense. And then they would usher you to one side of the courtroom or the other side of the courtroom. And of course, one side turned out to be white and one side turned out to be black. Um, and Kristen, who is white, um, and I would come to take our notes every day. And when we said neither, you know, we were neither with the prosecution or the defense, um, they would seat us on the right with the prosecution. Um, which some called the white side. Um, now, uh, th thus, um, the, you had this, um, uh, this, the, 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 the newspapers were filled with descriptions um, of the, the five, def the juvenile defendants as a clotted unit. In fact, they were tried together. They didn't have separate trials. They were all sitting in the courtroom up front. They were all called the wilders, that term urban wilding, wilding young men. <clears throat> um, they became a singular pack, five individuals melded into one hyper horrific, presumptively suspect profile. Um, there were purportedly confessions that never came out in the newspaper that the, in fact, the police officers had written the confessions and that when the confessions were read in court, um, there was something said, I and four other young black males were proceeding down the, it was, um, and I, and of my own notes, I, I found, you know, uh, the, the police officer testified, he didn't know if I've substituted Ramon's word for my own, but I wrote down what I recall. Did Ramon say, call himself a black male? Although, well, that was probably my words. Did he describe the victim as a female white? He probably said white female, or white girl. Um, and, and he, Every bit of it said, I don't recall if those were his words or mine. Um, but those were used as the confessions. And then they, were, they read them and, were, and videotaped them. And, the, and, that, and that, was, um, um, that was the basis on which they were, uh, testif they were, they were convicted. Um, and, uh, and aside from those confessions, there was no evidence of any sort. This was an extraordinarily bloody crime, if you recall, those of you who are old enough to recall it. The jogger lost about three quarters of the blood in her body, and the scene was a particularly muddy one. But there was no blood on any of the accused, nor were any of their footprints found at the scene. Soil traces in their sneakers had a mineral content consistent with the ground in the entire upper half of Manhattan, but which the prosecution maintained proved that they were in the park that night, because where else would you find soil? Um, <laughs> while the DA, in her final argument, maintained that hairs from the jogger were found on two of 
the defendants, the actual testimony of the forensic analyst was never so conclusive. Rather, he said the hairs were more consistent with Caucasian hair than African American, but this point sailed over the head of many in the courtroom, in part because there was such crude jocularity among the press. The press was very badly behaved in that case. I remember, you know, when the, when the, when the hair testimony, they said, did he say pubic hair? They were like teenagers, and the bailiffs always were shushing them. Um, and so, in the wake of all of this DNA evidence, I'm not surprised. And yet, one still has um, Linda Fairstein, who was a very reputable and, and good lawyer otherwise, she's still maintaining that these five young men had to have done something. They must have been involved in some criminal activity somewhere in the park that night, echoing that judge in Roxbury so long ago. And if there is evidence of other criminality, Fairstein should prosecute them for it. But this supposition was tested in the trial. None of the other mugging victims in that park at, the, in the, at that night identified any of these young men as their attackers. And if there is no evidence, evidence the insinuation is gratuitous um, and extremely self-serving. Yet, yet that case, even in the weight of this exculpation, set the stage for our present war on terror. The calls for holding them without lawyers for denying them access to families, um, fear as a defi defining force um, has never left us. That was a turning point, I think, in the jurisprudence on behalf of defendants, the jurisprudence of defendants. It preceded the O.J. Simpson trial, which was um, even worse in its excess, but O.J. Simpson was not a typical defendant either. Um, um, that was truly bread and circus, whereas this one was a real trial of young men um, who, uh, uh, um, uh, who reflected in many people's minds, even more powerfully than perhaps O.J. Simpson, the shape of the urban jungle, the wilding young men, panic like a flood, drowning all sense of statistical proportion. Now, I am intrigued by how this psychic relationship to statistical probability or improbability, as the case may be, is directed, even manipulated, as a political force. We trade precious civil liberties for amorphous promises of homeland security, for example, yet do virtually nothing to, to enact comprehensive and effective gun control, gun violence being the single greatest threat to American lives and liberty. But the hard evidence showing what a devastating impact guns have on public health is routinely ignored or trumped, not just by the extraordinary lobbying power of the NRA, but also, I think, by marketed images of the romantic outlaw, the noble vigilante. Products from cigarettes to pickup trucks have all exploited the Hemingway-esque appeal of the rational individualist patrolling the bounds of his property against rampaging savages, his trusty sidearm at the ready. Remember how things began to turn against the tobacco companies when the original Marlboro man, by then haggard and hacking, the model who played him, testified before Congress that he was dying of lung cancer. I think similarly, we need an alternative narrative to heroic violence, an other image than the strong-jawed, handsome, but well-armed and disgruntled Lone Ranger who rescues Pauline from her perils. And the rescuer is always white and male, the victim is always white and female, and the aggressor is always black. Now, another example of these raced and gendered fears, given political teeth, was the terror that seized Washington, D.C. when Muhammad Lee, uh, John Muhammad and Lee Malvo were killing people during their terrible, terrible sniping rampage a few years ago. Um, at first, there was a prevalence, if you recall, in the coverage of precisely such romanticized cowboy vocabulary. Before the arrests, most experts assumed that there was a single sniper, most probably what the media called a lone Caucasian man in his 20s or 30s, someone very, quote, smart, very calculating, very cool, very precise, and controlled. That was throughout the media. We heard hypotheses about the pleasure he was getting from the shootings, the game he was playing, the mysterious, even superhuman dimension of his escape artistry, and the probability that he had done time with some, quote, elite branch of the military. It was chilling, all right, but it was also romantic. One could almost envision Bruce Willis in the role. And this script was disrupted right after the arrests, however, when one Caucasian man was transmogrified into a, quote, pair of African-American males, 
and CNN devoted long hours to revisionist discussions of how dumb the suspects had been, about how many clues they'd left, how stupid they were for phoning police, how idiotic for demanding money. And it was a very polite version of the rampaging savage narrative, one that doesn't glorify dark culprits, but one that was still undergirded by the perceived social necessity for good lone rangers and their well-stocked gun racks as the last bastion of decency, home, and hearth. Now, again, this vocabulary, which has grown up in the years since then, seems to me to have been seeded by instances like that, instances like that of, pre of preemptive policing, of shoot to kill, of not wanting um, anyone to have an OJ trial, um, and therefore not wanting them to have a trial at all. I mean, I remember o Osama bin Laden and now Saddam Hussein, you don't want him to, have him to have an OJ trial, which seems to be a cipher, not just for the excess that that trial represented, um, but for due process itself. Um, terms like suicide by cop, and again, the phenomenon of out of control suspect profiling. To the extent that I was listening to National Public Radio again, I always listen to National Public Radio, my favorite source of <laughs> whatever. And they have in New York, this is WNYC spots. And they have random citizens saying, this is WNYC and this is who I am. And one of the more poignant ones I heard just, just um, broadcast uh, two or three days ago is, I'm a locksmith. A lot of people think I look like a robber, but I'm as nice a guy as you'd ever want to know. This is WNYC. <laughs> it was just the voice, no other information. Now, one just knew that such, such a succinct summary of identity, he had to be a man and a black man at that. And it really gave me pause because he had a slight tinge to his voice that might have been Southern in New York, but I've asked friends over and over again, who do you imagine this man is? Everybody says, of course he's a black man. What are you even asking for? Um, but what does it mean for us and our sense of citizenship and our sense of identity that just that, people think I look like a robber, but I'm as nice a guy as you'd ever want to see, that we assume, and again, I still don't know who this man actually is, um, but the assumption is that powerful and immediate. I've listened since September 11th, since the London bombings, and tragically enough, as though it were an act of terrorism, since um, that to the, uh, the suspicion we have of each other um, uh, in doctor's offices, panicked conversations, what would happen if we are evacuated? Um, taxi drivers could shut the city down because they're all foreigners. Why would, Muslim, why would that Muslim man next door be working as a salesman in the United States when he comes from a family of doctors in Yemen? The vague, unanswerable whys, framed as interrogatives, but are statements of suspicion, distrust, and dislike. He must be working as a salesman here when his family are doctors in Yemen because he doesn't belong here. These questions imply, leave dangerous holes of accusation. The unstated answer describes the otherwise unspeakable. Someone on uh, another uh, television program I heard um, was discussing quite, as a, a lawyer as I recall, uh, discussing quite seriously why the good guy living on Pity Pat Lane who mows his lawn and keeps his life in order should have to pay for some criminal across town to have a free high quality lawyer. The answer was, well, because it's a constitutional right. Um, but I don't think people get the Constitution enough to understand that it is what constitutes us. We pay for someone else's lawyer because we might be in the same situation one day. If there is never even the possibility that we would be innocent and poor, then that is what marks us as not part of the same constitutive body. If that is the case, then we have two different worlds of mine and thine. If we don't pay for a justice system that provides equally for everyone, what does American citizenship mean? What does justice mean if the notion of due process is a purchased luxury? What of human rights? What of the dignity that supposedly undergirds us? Right after the bombing in London, the Sunday Times um, ran a piece taking Cherie Blair to task um, because she is a lawyer and was very concerned about some of the anti-terrorism me measures, which are much 
worse even than some of the things that have come down under the USA Patriotic Act here. Um, and the title said, Sheree and the do-gooders give terror a chance. And the article scolds Sheree Blair, who supposedly, quote, burbles on about not cheapening our right to call ourselves a civilized nation with new laws. Trouble is, when we get soft, the extremists get busy. The article also decried stopping those with darker skins in proportion to those with whitish skins. It then launched into the great world of authorial imagination, the great license of those who have sufficient arrogance to indulge in absolute certitude that they will always be the infallible judges of right and wrong. And I quote, just imagine it. Yes, Sarge, we saw a bloke chanting to Allah with smoke pouring out of his big army rucksack, but we had searched our quota of Asians, so we made Miss, Mrs. Gro Mrs. Goggins, a granny of 86, empty her wicker basket instead. Just then there was an almighty bang from what remained of the Asian gent. Close quote. Now, this blue-haired granny, or Mrs. Goggins, or the blue-haired little old lady, is cited so often as a reason not to profile white people in general, and young brown men in particular, that if you were a terrorist, you'd have to be stupid not to consider using a little old lady. <laughs> I pray I'm wrong. I pray the lines aren't drawn so stupidly. But really, if they want to stop terrorism, they're going to have to check everyone. Everyone, no exceptions, rather than going by stereotypes. Stereotypes are too easy. Or, of course, go by some deeper form of profiling, that is to say, background or attitudes or writings or you know, something that, that actually gives some insight into who is a paid political operative, because the people who drove those airplanes in were not part of any suspect profile. They were well-dressed, no criminal record, although the FBI did have records on, on at least some of them. Um, they didn't fit a visual profile. Um, back then, young black men were the only visual profiles. Um, but uh, stereotypes of this visual sort are much, much too easy, and anti-stereotypes, like Little Red Riding Hood's granny, are just as obvious. At least I hope they're obvious to those charged with security. Um, and I hope they see that, it, those who are charged with our security. It's, it, it brings to mind a robber I wrote about years ago, um, a robber who went down to his local bank in Queens, New York, and robbed the bank, and as he was running down the street with his loot, um, a car pulled up, and mugged him and took the money. And he was so outraged that he went down to his local police department and reported that he had just been mugged. And, um, I, and, and it was reported all over Howard Stern as you know, being the funniest of all possible things. How stupid and idiotic can you get? And I actually called up this, the, I was working in Queens at, at CUNY at that time, and I called up the police station to find out a little bit more about this case. Because one of the things that I think it always rationalizes um, irrationality in, in our culture is the irrationality of race. And sure enough, it turns out the first bank robber was white, um, and he was, local, he, was, he was robbing his local friendly bank, you know. And the second robber was black, um, and it inspired, I guess, the, the bank robber to a higher sense of community norm that somehow, <laughs> you know, ideal. Um, but guarding the pale, um, against the invaders um, makes even bank robbers honest. But, it's, um, but I think that race is the only thing. It explains um, these otherwise idiotic stories. But in any event, as billions of, billions of dollars shift from education and infrastructure toward defense in and of our homeland, as security forces both here and abroad become less and less broadly educated in anything other than martial science, and I think that's what happened in Katrina. Katrina was evacuated by a Marshall model, by a triage model. It is interesting to ponder what money is going where in the now no longer war on terror, in case you haven't heard it, that the, the, it's been renamed a global struggle against violent extremism by the Bush administration. Um, I, I, I noted um, that, that while I was clearing out my family's house in Boston, I was reading the Boston Globe, and the Chinese government recently contracted with a company in Boston for a healthy shipment of bomb detecting machines with which to protect its rail system. And like the little match girl, I sort of wondered if that kind of machine couldn't serve us well too. I live in New York where now they're searching every 12th person apparently. And you know, if I were a terrorist, I would just arrange to be every fifth or sixth, seventh, eighth, I mean that gives me a good 11. Um, 
Or maybe just, you know, could we possibly get a rush order of bomb-sniffing dogs? But alas, on American trains, bewildered token take takers are, have been instructed to look for heavily dressed, shifty-eyed muggles who act, quote, suspiciously. Citizens are encouraged to follow their guts about what is suspicious or not. If you see something, say something, it says the subway notices in New York. And so buildings are emptied, roads blocked, subways stopped, all based on Roswellian sightings of evildoers. Five innocent tourists with British accents were handcuffed and Broadway in, New York, in, in the big Apple Manhattan was cordoned off for hours because a tour bus operator had been advised that, quote, stuffed pockets was a sign of suicide bombers. Now, they call into radio programs demanding more racial profiling of races other than themselves. New Yorkers call for profiling anyone who appears Asian, Arab, or Muslim, broad terms in a city where 100% of the population could appear to be one or some combination of that Asian, Arab, or Muslim. So that's where we are. 100% of New Yorkers suspicious of everyone else, startled as jackrabbits, spooked by official mandates to report big bags, unfriendly glances, and people who look lost. These are actual directives. Anybody looks lost, you report them. <laughs> what more perfect way to tie up a city? Indeed, on a daily basis, false alarms clog traffic, empty theaters, and halt industry. And this, to my mind, is not an abundance of caution, but the very definition of irrational fear. This unmoored panic is so sadly disconnected from the destructive potential of determined saboteurs, those who will always find ways to be numbers 9, 10, and 11 in the distribution of every 12th, or to appear un-Asian, un-Arab, and un-Muslim in ways that play against our supremely racialized, culturally limited superego. If the tragic execution of uh, de Meneses, the British ele electrician who, quote, looked Asian, an act apparently enabled by Britain's new policy of shooting to kill terrorism suspects. Um, if it has taught us nothing else, um, and apparently in Brazil, um, the newspapers were just stunned. They said, but in Brazil, he's white. He's white. How could this happen to him? Um, but here, we have Timothy McVeigh. We've had Columbine. We've had Eric Rudolph. It ought to have taught us the folly of appearance-based assumptions about, about criminality. Now, if I may be so bold, I think we are suffering a laziness of imagination and sloppy leadership at a very high level. S security, <laughs> security experts must know that neither bag searches nor racial profiling can protect subways efficiently or at all. But there are better options. Where are, the, again, those teams of bomb-sniffing dogs that should have been in our subways long ago? And is Homeland Security shopping for any of those machines that the Chinese have had such perspicacity to buy in bulk? Meanwhile, Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff was this summer busily defending his declaration that New York City subways, where he surmises only a very small number, maybe 30, are likely to be killed no matter how large an explosion, simply aren't as important as other possible targets like airplanes where everyone goes down. Again, billions of dollars have been earmarked for security, and I worry that, for, that in the much-touted balancing between freedom and security, a good deal has been tilted by pork barrel politics, corporate scrambling for government dollars, and general profiteering. Two days ago, I was listening to a radio report that I thought was on NPR, but it turned out to be the Drudge Report. And <laughs> There was a caller complaining that, he, that this country is losing its freedoms. And he said this is the first time that he has had his backpack searched in his life. And he was irate. And I had actually had hope at one point that people who had never had themselves searched in their lives would be a form a new political base for a more rational examination of this kind of profiling. Um, but no, he was concerned that his freedoms were down the tube, and therefore his solution was a time for more racial, racial profiling, because that will take care of things, and as he put it, then my freedom will be restored. Not ours, not his as a citizen, but his presumably as a white citizen. That was not what he said, but that has to be the import 
of what he was saying. And I think there's a kind of calculated insidiousness of this. Suddenly, the world is saying that profiling is an unqualified good. New categories of suspect profile, of suspect profile bubble forth in government advisory after government advisory, and I've been looking at the government advisories, race, ethnicity, and religion, a for sure, that's what we're all worried about, or at least as a starting point. But I don't know if you realize that there are also none profiles, um, because they are associated with um, giving shelter to undocumented persons. Um, there are uh, 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 men whose jowls are unusually clean shaven, men with shaved heads, men with long beards, people wearing heavy clothing, shoes with thick soles or big hats, women carrying large handbags, unknown delivery man, men bearing oversized packages, kids with backpacks or violin cases, cell phone users, sweaty people, cool as a sly cucumber people, people taking pictures of things you wouldn't, <laughs> people praying aloud, um, which ought to clear out all of Times Square, people who blink too much or not enough, men with thick waists, women pretending to be pregnant, those expressing curiosity about infrastructure, people who spend too much time in public libraries, men reeking of rose water, on and on it goes. Most recently, the most recent one that I have seen is one that says we are to be on the lookout for the great masses of the unshaved, unwashed, and unperfumed, to wit, vagrants who seem out of place, an almost calculated redundant designation, for fear that they might be terrorists posing as, quote, homeless people, shoe shiners, street vendors, or street sweepers. So, given a nation of once celestial cities, of all of whose denizens now are deemed dangerous, one hears calls for house-to-house -house searches, shoot-to-kill policies, and protection from, quote, too many civil rights. Debates rage about political correctness rather than whether this isn't beginning to look like we are backing into martial law or some system that effectively immunizes police from discriminatory behavior, scattershot decision-making, as well as deadly mistake. On the other side of the pond, London police sent the mother of de Menezes, the Brazilian electrician regret regrettably executed by official mistake, a sympathy note with a $27,000 check tucked in as, quote, compensation. And the part that really brought tears to my eyes was a touchingly generous little coda assuring her that, quote, if a claim were brought in future, then the sum offered today would be taken as being on account of any other payments. Political correctness, meanwhile, has morphed away from a dismissal of liberal martinets who didn't appreciate a good joke and who oppressed others with the crushing prejudices of their own anti-prejudice, and it has become an all-out question of life and death, patriotism and treason. These days, the politically correct are those shiny-eyed zealots who worry more about the feelings of terrorists than protecting the homeland and would sacrifice the rude but real rank and file upon the altar of false gods and secular demons. And according to this new narrative, the politically incorrect are the ones laying down their lives rough and ready, who cut through the bull to shoot first and ask questions later. And it seems almost incredible to me that only four or five years ago, the politically incorrect were those who were waiving the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights um, as, um, um, as the bulwark against um, all evil. Um, anyway. I, one of the little books that I found in my um, grandmother's trunk in the attic of the house I spent the summer cleaning out um, was a small first edition um, of a book by Grover Cleveland, of all people, and this is the only time I've ever quoted Grover Cleveland in my life, but I am about to now. Um, and he wrote an apparently lost book to history called Good Citizenship. And uh, he, in it, he tells of a, quote, good old lady who was wont to impressively declare that she had always noticed that if she lived until the 1st of March, she lived all the rest of the year. And it is quite likely, he says, that she built a theory upon this experience which induced her with the passing of each of these fateful days to defy coughs, colds, and consumption, and the attacks of germs and microbes in a million forms. However this may be, we know that with no design or intention on her part, there came 
a first day of March, which passed without her earthly notice. And I think that when I think about that good old lady who ascribes a kind of upside down sense of cause and effect, it does sort of remind me of what has happened in, or did happen in Louisiana, for, where for years and years people would point to the levees and say, this is where the big, this is where it's going to break when the big one comes. Um, another book I found was a 1878 edition um, of a description of the city of New Orleans, and it was shortly after the Great Flood, um, a few years before there, before that. And they were talking, uh, uh, it was actually 1898, this book was published, and they were talking about Charles Dickens having written about it, and Mark Twain having written about it, and everybody was pointing to where the levees were going to break when the big one hit. Um, and I think that this little quote from Grover Cleveland made me think that in the spirit of good citizenship, we need to have our sense of cause and effect, our sense of fault and responsibility, our notion of order and logic repaired, and repaired now. Because I think, I do feel that our racial biases, our racial levies, are about to collapse if we leave them with the continued kind of inattention and the continued kind of denial that has characterized this most recent tragedy um, as the enormous tides of our global diaspora come closer and closer to these shores in whatever horrific forms. Um, we can fight none of it if we are and remain a house divided. Thank you. Now I think I'm supposed to take questions at either of the microphones, if you like. Oh, actually, no, I'm supposed to pause while there is a mass exodus. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes.
Mm -hmm. that would counter the individualistic, I'm going to take care of myself attitude that is a piece of the problem that we, we have today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have some measure of optimism for the future. What goes into that heroic narrative? How do we recognize that we are brothers and sisters? We are American citizens. We are a free people, and we're stronger when we recognize all those things. How do we say that? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't have. Uh, you're you're asking me at perhaps the wrong moment in time. I, I and, and I let, let me let me put, let me actually let me try to start by saying that it's also true that this hurricane produced the largest outpouring of contributions in history. I don't think just our history, but in history. It, it rivaled and overtook even the tsunami in Indonesia. Um, it was an enormous display of putting out. And the country, I think people have been transported to many, many states. And again, that, that I, I think that that should not be overlooked, it, although inevitably it will be overlooked because of the mess that preceded it, um, or that, that caused um, the necessity for, 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 for this. But, uh, I, and I don't want to disparage that or discount that, um, because people from so many places and of so many races and of so many religions came together um, to make that possible. Um, at the same time, I do think that we, uh, would be wrong to be happy-faced about what has happened because um, uh, the real neighbors, the, the real, the horrible stories coming out are within the neighborhoods of New Orleans or the little towns like St. Helena is only 80 miles uh, away. Uh, the towns that uh, moved out of New Orleans to get away from those types. And that's a recurring, I think. It's, we, 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 we are at our best in a time of crisis. And it is the day-to-day -day real estate shopping and the, the coded language about good school districts and so forth um, that is the heart of the dilemma that we face. Um, and so I guess my concern is that we are almost too optimistic of people sometimes. So that's maybe the caution I would give. And that I would actually be more happy if we were a little bit more pessimistic in a sense of taking in some of the realities of our divisions. Um, because what I see happening in the wake of the hurricane is what often happens around these terrible events in the wake of riots or in the wake of great racial division. Um, people come and say, but look how wonderful we are, we mean so well, and there's this healing process that goes on, but it's, it's, it's like two different groups of people speaking, um, and that we don't really get to the heart of it. And I think in one of the books I've, I wrote, and I don't remember which one, quite some time ago, I remember first moving to New York, and it was right after the Crown Heights division, and um, it was a horrible event, and the communities involved never really healed, but there was a staged sense of um, healing because at one point they brought in some black kids to talk to some um, Jewish kids because it, this was the, the great black Jewish rift that happened in New York at that time. And um, when they tried to do it with the communities involved, they discovered that the black kids didn't look polite enough and they were kind of sulky and they didn't really want to, and they didn't, didn't say anything that was particularly um, telegenic. And then it turns out that the Hasidic kids couldn't sent, sit with the girls and boys in the same room and so that wasn't going to work out. So they got a group of black kids and white kids from um, uh, New York's private schools, all of whom were very nicely gussied up. And they had a beautiful discussion about harmony and diversity and its joys and values. Now again, it's, it's wonderful to model that sort of thing and it's wonderful to aspire to that and to use it as, as an educational tool. But if this is going to be the, the you know, the, the, and I think we do that a lot, I think, and, and, and that's what worries me right now. Um, and, and so the profiling, the, the actual political organization and base for profiling, um, I think is something that we need to be quite frightened about because I think that it, it involves something other than that kind of masquerade. It involves a kind of political networking whose um, strength, I, I'm not sure where that's going to come from right now. 
Um, and uh, I think it also requires really, I, I exhort my students to look at the U.S. Constitution and look at the USA Patriot Act side by side. Um, and that takes work. And I don't see a lot of people doing that. Um, it really involves people who are most frightened of those invaders coming across the bridge from imagining um, that they are having, that they are also having, you know, that they are part of the groups um, having to um, seek the hospitality of neighbors. Um, and I, 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 that that involves a kind of imagination that I wish the media. I think that you know it's, it's the product. It, you know, it, it may involve you know very specific kinds of literary undertakings, um, because I think, on, in some way, that we have a political division that won't be simply it won't deal with this simply by um, sitting down at the, in the same town hall. Um, so that's why I would worry more before I provided an, an heroic model. Um, Yeah, I mean, yeah, don't. I mean, you've asked a number of questions, actually. I mean, you know, who is pushing racial profiling? I don't think that there is such, I don't think that there's an entity that's pushing it. I think that this is a much more complex cultural phenomenon, and that's partly why the, the you know, the earlier question was hard to answer. Um, I do think that the media has a huge involvement in the creation of stereotypes, the media creates ideals, or it, it you know, it's, it's you know, from from feminine images of rail thin Kate Mosses to black men as threatening or hulking. But these are not original to this moment in time. I think the media has magnified what were trends in American culture uh, and stereotypes for a long time. You know, sort of the, the virginal white woman, uh, you know, who was sort of waifish and innocent and Black men were either comics or whatever, and black women were large and ample. And these have all, these have been re rotating aspects of those stereotypes have rotated through American culture for a very long time, taking on like snowballs various aspects of of one crisis after another. Um, but my sense is that again, this kind of racial division is something which is the product of history. It was made, it was created, it was reinforced by laws at various points. Um, I do think this is a particular precarious moment. That's why I sort of back down from being too much of an optimist because I think that the USA Patriot Act allows so much hiding of the degree to which this can be exploited by an increasingly centralized government um, or that discrimination seems to be very low on the order of um, uh, anti-discrimination. It seems to be very low on the list of priorities of, of, of the Justice Department these days. Um, I, I do worry that um, uh, that you find a kind of complete inversion of the civil rights movement right now um, that has nothing to do with the media, but I th do think has been exploited by various groups in the media. Um, as a lawyer, I am worried about a series of cases as well as political maneuverings around the renewal of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. Um, I'm worried about cases, for example, that say it is against the law. There was a Pacific Legal Foundation argument recently um, in Capistrano School District in California um, and the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is a fairly conservative uh, legal foundation, has uh, sued to say that it, uh, a, they were attempting to put a school, 
sort of at the crossroads, and they, this is a case very similar to others popping up around the country it, it, that would have access so that it would be diverse. Um, so it would be on the edge of many neighborhoods which are otherwise fairly geographically segregated. And they have sued saying that it is um, against the law to take, um, um, to, to use race to either segregate or to integrate. Um, that's, that's, and, and so this sort of, you know, if it's against the law to use race at all to integrate, then there is no, the, the, the law has no teeth um, to enforce civil rights at all. Then there is no remedy. Um, and I think that the color blindness that Martin Luther King spoke of has been bastardized in that way. So that this rhetoric, very calculated rhetoric, somebody had to think to come up with that, um, um, has, been, uh, has been terrible. In today's newspaper, there was an article about um, a bill that I think has passed the House allowing um, federal dollars or tax dollars to go to organizations which discriminated according to religion. Um, so that that is to say you can pay an organization which says it will hire nobody but the religion. Um, and that, that was supposedly, um, when we started talking about faith-based initiatives, that was supposed to not happen, that there would no, be no discrimination according to religion where tax dollars were involved. And so in a very backdoor way, we're undoing things like the Bob Jones University decision. Um, and, and, and if you think Bob Jones University hasn't had a hand in the characterizing, um, or shaping some of these lawsuits. So I think it's, it's very complex. I think it's, it's, the, you know, it's, it's, it's the political moment. It is fear of terrorism. It's the media oversimplification of identity groupings. Um, it's identity groupings presenting themselves in ways that are rather flat. Um, um, and I think it's also built into a kind of habit of rhetoric. So when the FBI or in Britain you hear the same thing says, you know, Muslims have to distinguish themselves, you know, um, Muslims are, we know, good people and they're acting in a certain way, um, that are responsible citizens and we have absolutely no problem with them, but not enough of them are standing up to distinguish themselves. This is a contradiction in terms. They're either good citizens, you know, who are part of the polity, so why should they have to come up with their hands waving, saying, I am distinguished from the rest of them all? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, and, and it reminds me very much, that's a habit of rhetoric that I think, I remember when Louis Farrakhan was acting the fool or was much more in the media, I mean, where has, he seems to have disappeared off it, but you know, remember in those days, you know, every black intellectual in the world was asked to say, you know, distinguish yourself. Every place I spoke, somebody would say, well, why haven't you disclaimed Louis Farrakhan? I said, where, where did that come from? Louis Farrakhan, and people would sort of magnify. Louis Farrakhan had a following of 10,000 at the highest point in the, in the United States. And, um, uh, and it didn't matter how many times you did disclaim, you still, it was almost like you had to be granted permission. And I think that those kinds of things are, all interconnected, so it's a huge snarl. And, and so I, you know, in terms of what can you do, I think you need to do what you can. Um, you know, get your education, be committed, find something you love, and see how it has resonance for a larger political engagement. Um, find, a, find a space you can do good. I, I, just one final comment about this. I do think that, the, and I say this often, but as, a, as <laughs> Um, that again, we have this indomitable American spirit of optimism, and we have the, you know, the little cliches that say, we are the world and we're going to f cure world hunger. We're always going to cure world hunger. Um, and there's a way in which that can be very paralyzing, because we can't cure all of world hunger, and you can't be the world all the time. And um, I think that we ought to have somewhat more modest goals about being politically engaged, um, about righting wrong where you find it, um, and that if you can do that in any given year and calculate that you've made a little bit of difference within the course of, of a life, then that's what we can do. That's what we can do, and it will be less paralyzing than saying, I didn't change the world and it's just all getting worse, because then you'll just, you'll, be, you, you'll wring your hands. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to get back to that point, because uh, I think on the one hand, uh, what you're mentioning is that there's a lot of optimism here, and, and it does bother me a lot that when I discuss with people about any, anything that is not perfect in the society, then I'm always told that this is still the best country yeah. in the world. There couldn't be any other place that could do it better. And this seems to be actually almost an assumption that everybody, who, most people make over here. 
But on the other hand, you know, when you look at other societies where they have been able to deal with some of these issues, uh, there is a lot of self-flagellation that goes on. There's a lot of dialogue that goes on. And, um, and, and so I'm a little bit torn. On the one hand, I do see countries like Germany is one that I'm familiar with, like, and uh, Germany, Germany. Uh, and, uh, and, and having seen them go through this whole process in the last uh, 20 years almost of getting over this whole guilt and of coming to terms with it. And, and I find actually Germany to be one of the most desirable places to be. And, um, and another place I would say would be a place like Finland or Sweden, where again, uh, everything is up for discussion. And, and there's always the assumption that yes, we could be doing things wrong, and perhaps we could do it better. On the other hand, when you're in the US, there's just the assumption that we, nobody could do it better, and, and we know it. And in some ways, you see the gains. And then I'm also told that, well, this is a very young society. So you know, give us another 1,000 years, and we'll be able to do it better. Uh, so I'm not quite sure uh, where, you know, I mean, I, I do realize that there has to be more education, there has to be more, more discussion, and so on. But I think that people here live in a completely different world. I mean, they're completely separated from the rest of the world. But that does seem to work in their favor. And so given the realities that... that work, work in whose favor? You well, mean, in I the, mean, in America, in, in, yeah. you know, America is, yeah. is at this point the superpower. America can, can go and do anything anywhere in the world, and we can complain, and we can protest, and we can do everything that we want. But, the, but you know, this is what... I, I'm originally from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to people, they say, but, you know, America is all-powerful. So we are caught. We are caught in, in this dilemma that a society that chooses to, to ignore any ill that it promotes, that, that exists, actually gets away with being on top, whereas others who, who are more deliberate, who do think, who do, you know, do it in a more systematic manner, they actually lose out. So how do we then weigh this, and how do we tell our children that, you know, no, it is still better to be deliberate, to be maybe not the superpower, but you see what I'm getting at. I mean, yeah. you're caught in a certain dilemma there because the powerfulness, the military might of the US is still something that makes almost everybody in the world say, no, they, have, they must have got it right. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, I, I can't speak completely um, to the perception of the United States outside, of the, the, they must have gotten it right um, perception, because, uh, and I do worry that we have squandered they don't like the some US. of that perception. Yeah, we've squandered some of that perception yeah. in recent years. It's just that they yeah. are powerful and they can do what they can, so why do you want them to change? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what anyone wants to be? Mm -hmm. I, I don't buy that argument. Yeah. Yeah. But we do get into that problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what the, the first thing that comes to mind is to, I mean, it, and it does connect to what the, the the young man had said over here. What can we do? Is I do think that there is a part of our national mentality that has a um, what is it called? A um, inferiority complex, despite all of his power, and that that's really the double edge that you're hearing. Um, there's a fierce pride coming from the ability to be self-created, um, that, that we uh, come from a culture that places so much pride on being self-invented, that, um, you know, that we escaped the status largely of the European influence of, of, of the Europe, which many of our immigrants came from. Um, and so if you say it, you make it so. And so there's almost a self, you know, we are the best, and as long as you keep saying that, and it's, and I think it's got a, it, it, it serves a function other than simply to really tout an examined sense of where we are in the world. Um, we are very powerful, thanks to the resources that we have. Um, but I do think sometimes that when I hear that line, we are the greatest country in the world, and the tremendous sense, well, why aren't the French more grateful to us for having dragged them or saved them, you know, during World War II? Um, that this is about sort of not being
being in the political moment. Um, it's, 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 um, there's a kind of um, worry around the edges. There's a worry around the edges. And I think that that's where you hear the, 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 the greatest jingoism in that regard. Um, at the same time, as I said, we are the most powerful country in the world. And it worries me when we, as citizens of the most powerful country in the world, feel as helpless as we do. And that's what I think is also part of the mentality of saying, we're so great, we're wonderful, we're wonderful, we're wonderful. Um, because sometimes we're not entirely convinced of it. Um, and I think that comes from a sense of political disengagement um, for, for a whole lot of reasons. And that disengagement um, uh, you know, launches us into the realm of a kind of mythological relation to the country rather than a day-to-day -day political engagement where you sit and you fight out something in the town hall and nothing and you know that human you know we're human and we're not perfect I mean that, that, that nothing is the greatest in the world you know that, that, so we're not the Roman Empire we're not you know, we are we are um, and so I think that that's so that's that's part of why I think that's a little bit deceptive and, and th there's a contradiction at the heart of that um, the other thing that I think particularly around our racial debates um, um, and our national identity as a raced country, um, which, which you know, goes back and forth between being colorblind and being divided, um, has, and this is pure hypothesis on my part, but um, I remember teaching a course on race and class some years ago with a psychoanalytic, theorist, th uh, psychoanalytic philosopher. And again, I say this because this is not my field with some Qualification. Please correct me if I'm wrong. For those of you who know better, but she defined trauma as um, a the result of a, a, some psychic injury that is so deep that it knocks the words out of you, or it occurs to you if you're a child. It's sort of prelingual, but it occurs to you, and it literally you lose the words to describe the injury that has occurred to you, um, and that it becomes over generations that you extend it to your children by as, as a kind of taboo. Um, and that the, you know, the cure begins when you find words or you find words to represent it because otherwise without those words you simply reenact it and you, you, you repeat it, you, there's this kind of repetitive quality to it over and over and over again. Again, whether this is true psychoanalytically or not, it struck me as being a very interesting narrative for what we have done around race, the extraordinarily violent history of race in this country. The, incredible numbers of, you know, the Strom Thurmond story or the Sally Hemings story, you know, the, 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 the slave breeding and the rapes that occurred um, within, you know, what were essentially families um, and the loss of the vocabulary is, you know, my, my, the book Alchemy was about, you know, always being raised with this image of the master, the master who was actually, wait a second, he's my great, great grandfather, you know, sort of like the, 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 that it was entirely buried in the vocabulary of commerce rather than family. Um, and so I think that, that for, you know, for generations and then people who come to this buy into it, but there is an extraordinary amount of taboo about speaking about how dangerous race is. I mean, lynchings and the extraordinary um, degree to which lynchings involved burning of bodies and of dividing up of body parts and taking of ears like the bulls in Spain or cutting off of, of penises and body parts and, and, and bones and, and, and putting them on mantelpieces. I mean, I, I think that this is something that has shaped us and shaped our grandparents. And, you know, I'd love to know, for example, you know, during the, um, when President Bush went to Mississippi after the Katrina and said, you know, he, he said he was really looking forward to seeing Trent Lott's house rebuilt and, and he wanted to sit on the porch and rock a while. Um, and I was interested because apparently Trent's Lot House is 154 years old, which means that it was probably built in part with slave labor, um, that, he must have, that the family probably had slaves. It's apparently a beautiful old historic mansion. And I began to wonder about this, you know, what, what goes into, our, what goes into our, our, our unconscious political history that divides us in these red state, blue state ways as we describe it now, but which when you really look at it so resembles some part of the unfinished civil war um, um, and so much of its vocabulary, it's, it's bursting out again, I think. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you for such an amazing talk. Um, oh, I really you. appreciated the 
return to rationality and logic as opposed to some of the emotion that I think drives a lot of the policies that we're seeing right now. But I was really struck when you said that Katrina had brought the largest outpouring of generosity ever, basically, um, at the same time that we have essentially gutted the welfare system. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know quite what my question is, but I'm really struck by the sense that we will respond to absolute catastrophe, but not ongoing need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just wondered if you, I know you mostly work on the law, but I wondered if you wanted to connect in any way for us sort of legal changes that have occurred simultaneously with the gutting of an economic social safety net. Well, I mean, there's so many. I mean, it's hard to keep up. It's almost every day, and that's what worries me. That's why I'm, I am not, you know, I, I don't see a, a, you know, an admirable heroic model coming. I see, you know, the vaunting of people who have, um, um, who are, who are really, you know, symbols who are torn from the statistical actual substance, and and I think that that's not a great course to proceed. I mean, I, get, I think that you know, role models are fine, and I've always been a big believer in role models. But if you have a role model who, for example, and there's been a lot of controversy about Condoleezza Rice as a great role model, and that's fine. That's fine. I mean, she's entitled to her political opinions. But if she is, you know, the you know representative, and, and that's how it's being wanted of black people, then you know, it's it's it it it, it buries in some way. It buries the fact that 92 percent of black people voted Democratic and disagree with her. Or, you know, 97 percent disagree with her, and the rest, you know, vote voted socialist or something else. But very, you know, the, 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 those who actually vote Republican or who would work in her position, I mean, that he's rounded up every single one of them. And that's, you know, fine, that's fine. I have no objection to that. But it, it is sort of a, you know, if, if in fact we are allowed to believe that, um, you know, there are, it, it, you know, th that this is the way good black people behave, um, then I think it's a, it's a kind of misrepresentation and it's not politically motivating. It's not politically engaging for, for, for the remainder of African Americans. And, and in fact, it sort of echoes the old South of, you know, they're good Negroes and then there are the, <laughs> the, all the rest. Um, and, and in fact, I mean, there are 92% of people who have an experience which pushes them to a different policy. That's what we need to be dealing with. And, you know, it's fine. Condoleezza Rice is great. She can be whoever she wants, but don't represent, don't make her a representative of African Americans, um, because that implies some sort of statistical relationship to the experience of being African American. And I think that, that you can propagandize in a way that turns the statistics against the symbol. You know, it, it takes sign from symbol. And I think that's what um, worries me a bit about this. Now, in terms of the, you know, the, 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 you're right, I mean, the great outpouring, but it only happens in catastrophe. You know, this is, I suppose, a, a great, you know, this happens frequently when people feel guilty rather than politically motivated and, and, and so, or engaged. Um, in terms of other, um, you know, the, the, the economics of it, I mean, one of the things that worries me a lot for example, about the, the representation of what went on in New Orleans um, is that it's just about class, it's not about race, it's just about class. And it's certainly true that um, poverty is a huge part of it, but I worry that the drive to represent all of our problems as only class and not race is a way of disengaging from the civil rights movement. We do not have economic rights in this country like many other nations, and therefore if it's only poverty, you don't have any legal claim whatsoever. You know, it's all up to you because you're a rational individual economic actor who could make things happen if only tried harder or were taught better or who pushed more. Um, and the degree to which in our society class is to some degree a racial, I mean, to a very large degree a racial phenomenon and that African Americans are underclasses, William Julius Wilson has, has, you know, that we are categorized as under, beneath the class system, which is a weird way of describing us in class terms. Whereas almost nobody else is described as underclass but black people. Um, um, and uh, I, I've never heard a white person being called underclass. Um, and middle class, you're just never middle class, you're always black middle class or you're middle class. So middle class is unraced, <laughs> but then black middle class is a separate category from really the middle class. And then when you look at how middle class is defined sociologically, um, 
the black middle class really doesn't meet the same definition as white middle class because white middle class is capped by upper middle class and then wealthy. Whereas black middle class is any black person who is employed in any job from security guard to mailroom to Oprah Winfrey or Dr. Huxtable. They're all black middle class, right? Um, so I, I do think that, you know, that that's one fear I have is that there's been a disinvestment in the civil rights movement in favor of class analysis in a society which doesn't, which, which looks down on the kind of class analysis that would actually bring some recourse. Um, taking into consideration the deep-seated racial issues that this country suffers from, in your personal opinion, do you think that it will ever be possible to uh, for America to become a house that's not divided when you consider the racial issues that we have, and how many of them we, we have? have to, and it may take looking at the long view. Um, but you know, we weren't. This was not always a house divided. You know, this was. You know, you, 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 this was not always. I mean, race was not always the division. You know, the, the, did not always divide us in the ways it does now. This was the product of very specific moments in history, litigation, policies, and so forth. And again, when I say let's take taking the long view, look at how race really developed. I mean, race goes all the way back to sort of the the breeding of cattle and cows and the eugenics that came about. Um, uh, you know, when, when people read on to science um, and then read on to religion, um, you know, God created the tribes differently or, or you know, that, that, that we have evolved into, you know, s smarter races and, and, and more animalistic races. But it's, um, it's, you know, the Irish were really, I think, one of, among, you know, the first Term, use of the term race. In Britain today, you still hear Irish are a race. They're a race apart. Um, um, Eastern Europeans were, we, we, we can't forget that, that, yes, even our definition of who's black in this country has shifted in the last 30 years, um, last 50 years, 100 years. Um, Portuguese um, in certain parts of New England were considered black at one point. Um, so it's a very shifting and malleable definition. It will change. It is changing. It is always changing. Um, changing for the better, I think, will require the kind of commitment that undoes not just 150 years or 200 years or 300 years, but at least 400 years of race science and race perceptions. One of the reasons, again, I feel this is a very precarious moment is that not only are we dealing with the, you know, the USA Patriot, fear of terrorism, global diaspora, we're also dealing with the new Human Genome Project and DNA science onto which the possibility of improving the race or, improve, or separating you know, the perfect child, um, which will certainly, if it becomes a kind of industry of genetic selection, will benefit those who um, also have more money. So you do believe that it's possible for us to solve our problems and come together in unity? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at that level, I am profoundly an optimist. Um, if not about this moment, yes, I, we've, 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 the world. There have been better moments and there have been worse moments. And again, I, I always cite my mother. My mother is 87, or my and my father. Um, you know, they're 87 and 90 years old, respectively. You know, they 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 survived the Great Depression, McCarthyism, Hitler. Um, my mother survived pneumonia with no antibiotics. The world changes, and you can't predict what will happen. And again, the best you can do is the best you can do, but you have to have a commitment to making it better. Um, you know, things, things rise and fall. Um, and again, you know, I, I couldn't have predicted that we were discussing torture even as recently as five years ago. Um, but I must say, two months ago, I wouldn't have thought that we would have had as much of an anti-war movement all of a sudden as we do now. So, you know, we catch the wave. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Williams, for coming to K-State. Um, we're going to be doing the book signing now. If you uh, would like to move out in the hall and perhaps purchase one of uh, Professor Williams's books and get a signature. Thank you for coming tonight.